So good morning, everybody. My name is Jens Chapman. It's a distinct uh, pleasure and honor to welcome all of you, colleagues, a lot of alumni and uh, visiting professors, um, members of the community here to Harborview. It's our second annual summit in Seattle. This meeting, if you ask, was born out of about three decades worth of um, presentations at the end of uh, the fellowship year of each year. We had the visiting professors and fellows talk to one another and we always thought this is an incredible body of knowledge and a great exchange of uh, uh, wisdoms. Uh, we should open this up to a larger community. So from this we decided to create this summit in Seattle. We always have an anatomic focus and this year it is hand and upper extremity injuries. Uh, we're very privileged to have one of the absolutely premier groups of hand and upper extremity surgeons uh, in Seattle at the University of Washington. And it's a very unique collaboration between the Division of Plastic Surgery and the Department of Orthopedic Surgery with a truly amazing collaboration with our therapists and uh, staff across the system. And they've uh, formed a truly visionary enterprise and we'll hear a lot about uh, their work and about their scientific advances also. Um, we also have a great visiting faculty to correlate to our own upper extremity service. A great trauma center like Harborview could not be without its leadership and its administration. It's a particular great honor for me to ask Mrs. Janice Spiso to come up here. Uh, she's our chief uh, health officer uh, of the University of Washington and University of Washington Medical Center and Harborview. She's a vice president of medical affairs. So, Janice. Thank you. Well, thank you. Everything that we've done at Harborview and at UW Medicine has definitely been a team effort, and the cornerstone was our ability to really have a world-class department of orthopedic surgery and sports medicine in our system that has allowed Harborview to flourish and UW Medicine as a health system to flourish. I really want to thank Jens and extend a warm welcome to all of our UW Medicine faculty and staff, our community partners, and our nationally and internationally recognized invited speakers. We're thrilled to have you here on our campus today. As I mentioned, UW Medicine is extremely proud to have this world-class Department of Orthopedic Surgery in our system. And we value the work that is done by our teams each and every day, 24 hours a day, to really improve the health of patients in our region. As Jens mentioned, there's a real um, esprit de corps in our teams and definitely a focus on putting the needs of the patients first. So we will see people running in and out of our conference today, and I think that's for the greater good. We are also thrilled to announce the appointment of Dr. Jens Chapman as the new chair and look forward to his leadership to take UW Medicine and this world-class department into the future. UW Medicine as a health system has been expanding. Many of you may have heard about that recently over this past year. Our system now includes eight entity, Harborview Medical Center, which we're on site today, UW Medical Center, Northwest Hospital and Medical Center, Valley Medical Center in Renton, our UW Neighborhood Clinics, which will be expanding to nine locations throughout Seattle and King County, Airlift Northwest, our UW Physicians Practice Plan, and the UW School of Medicine. We're really pleased um, throughout our system to see the work of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery really helping us earn great marks locally and nationally. Most recently, the work that they've done helped earn us a top spot on U.S. News & Report Honor Roll. And also in our local Seattle ratings, it really helped earn UW Medical Center a number one hospital spot, Harborview Medical Center number two, and Valley and Northwest came in tied for number six. In addition, we've had much recognition for our faculty. Eight of our faculty have been named Best Doctors in Seattle, and one of them is even a Hall of Famer, our course co-chair, Dr. Doug Hannell. So thank you all for attending. It's great to have this type of participation, and we're hopeful that this will be a remarkable day of learning. Thank you. 
I will now ask the two co-chairs of this program, Dr. Nick Vetter and Dr. Hanel, to take uh, the podium and introduce our uh, faculty. Well, thank you. Probably the one defining entity at the University of Washington is the fact that there is only one HAND program. We are the HAND program. And it has uh, no bounds and no barriers between plastics and orthopedics. It is the HAND program, and we represent and partner with our colleagues in my immediate department, orthopedics and sports medicine, and in my immediate other partner and department uh, and section of plastics and reconstructive surgery. I want to echo what Doug uh, and Yen said about the collaboration that we have here between plastic surgery and orthopedic surgery in hand and upper extremity. It really is the single most rewarding aspect of my professional career, uh, as well as being a Harborview doc. And there's nothing like being a Harborview doc, and Joe Neese knows that very well. Every, every day you wake up, you know that you will have an opportunity to make a difference in a patient's life that will last them for their entire life, and there's nothing more rewarding than that. So that's uh, all I have to say, and I look forward to the next two days. So with that, I, I'm going to introduce the first speaker, and this is the formal introduction of uh, John Jack Wilbur. He's the uh, Chief of Musculoskeletal Trauma at uh, Metro Health Center in Cleveland. He uh, is recognized um, in the United States as one, of the, uh, as one of the true experts and true teachers in the management of multiple and complex fractures. Welcome. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to talk about clavicle fractures. It's always tough to be first up and talk about something like this, which is somewhat controversial. Um, if I were to give this talk five years ago, it would, it would have been not should they be fixed, but it would be who cares, uh, because no one really cared about clavicle fractures. And I think things have changed over the years, and I think that we're swaying towards maybe the pen, this pendulum that we talk about in medicine is swinging and maybe swinging a little bit too far now. And I think that we have to bring some common sense down as to uh, what should be treated and what shouldn't be treated. Okay. I want to talk a little about the anatomy and functional morphology, which I think is very important about any bone that we're fixing. You need to understand what it does and what it is before we talk about fixing it. A little review of the literature, talk about indications for surgery, and finally talk about methods of repair. The thing you have to realize, I think, that the clavicle is a unique anatomic structure. Basically, it's a mobile strut. It maintains alignment and stability of the scapula, once again, keeping it posterior, not allowing it to come to the lateral plane. It's a scaffold, a scaffold for muscle, ligaments, and major ligaments attachments. It's a protection. As we know, there's major neurovascular structures that sit down below it, and there's no question we, we can't argue about the cosmetic effects of a clavicle or the, the bad cosmetic effects of a mouse-shaped clavicle. Uh, this is a sort of a nice axillary view of a clavicle of the shoulder. And you see here, here's the glenoid. And all the forces want to push this glenoid into a lateral plane. And what keeps it out to the side is the con uh, contrary forces, the strut forces of the clavicle, pushing it out the other way. Now, if, you if here's your, plate, your sagittal plane here, as your clavicle shortens, what happens is that this shoulder moves around to the side. So this is what happens here to your glenoid. It moves more uh, lateral into the wrong plane. The question, does that make a difference? Well, I think it surely doesn't make a difference. And there's no question that position of the glenoid is going to make a difference as to where it's sitting as to the function of that joint. We also know that the cam effect, the particular shape of the clavicle, this S-shaped shape, acts as a cam effect, which allows for elevation and depression of the scapular body. So it controls it not only as a strut, but also as a cam effect, keeping it depressed as the, the shoulder moves. So the anatomy of it is an inner member of this bone. This is very important. Um, not because that's the way it's formed, but because of, because of that, its blood supply is purely limited to uh, the surrounding structures. It doesn't have a major nutrient artery, and so its blood supply is somewhat tenuous. It has two major articulations, has strong ligaments attachments, and has major muscular attachments. And once again, this is what we see in the clavicle. I'm not going to hear to talk about anatomy, uh, but what's important is not only what's on the surface, but also what's underneath it. And you see these are major structures uh, that can be injured not only with the injury, but also with the surgery. So you need to be aware of that. Uh, the two joints are dire, true diarthroidal joints. They give stability, but they also give controlled motion. And the most of the joints are very uh, critical. We know that fusion of these, these joints can significantly alter the uh, function of the shoulder. So once again, the mobility and stability are very important. Uh, looking at the human clavicle, uh, we know that it's a relatively S-shaped curvature in the axial plane, but it's also flat or C-shaped in the AP plane. Uh, so we feel that it's highly evolved structure. 
It has a very consistent form, not a random form. It has a very specific function, and it's integral to shoulder function. And because of that, I would maintain that if function follows form, then malfunction follows malformation. And that's my premise for fixing clavicle fractures based on that. So I think that there is an indication for it based on the functional morphology of what we understand the clavicle does. Looking at the injury, 4% of all fractures, 30% of all shoulder fractures, 64 per 100,000, 80% of them are mid-shaft clavicle fractures. Once again, looking at where they occur, 80% are mid-shaft. Fortunately, only 5% are medial because those are very problematic. I don't know if anybody's treated those things. They're difficult to treat. Um, but fortunately, 80% are in an area which are fairly easy to treat. The majority of them are low-velocity, isolated injuries with minimal to mild displacement. Mechanism of injury, simple falls, sports, and motor vehicle accidents are by far the most common. A place like Harborview and, and, and also in Cleveland at the Metro, it's mostly high-velocity injuries. Once again, a very different animal, but oddly enough, the ones I fix the most of are bicyclists and equestrians for some reason, the ones who come and want to have something done. Those are the two people sort of demand that something be done. So it's not always the amount of trauma, it's really sort of the demands of the patient that force us into fixing it many times. Associated injuries, I think the amazing thing is with these associated things, there's not that many of them. Um, if these structures, these major structures so close, it just amazes me that we don't see more problems with them. But be aware of them because they do occur every so often. And if you miss them, it's a disaster. So these are the ones you have to be aware that they are there and they could, it could happen. Looking at classifications, multiple different classifications, just looking at the AOOTA classification is broken up into fifth. Basically, you have the two ends and the, and the, the, the three metal sections are where the majority of the fractures occur. Um, once again, and the further classification is based on the amount of comminution and displacement. Looking at the injury, this is what we normally see. We look at the patient, see a little bit of a bump there, say you're gonna have a bump there, it's gonna heal up and everybody's gonna be fine. And this is all the farther we look many times. Uh, and this is what we see on the plain x-ray. You see it's a little bit displaced, doesn't look all that bad, and I think most people would say, this, you're not gonna have any problems, just send them home and they're gonna do okay. But if you really look at the patient and look at the x-ray, this is what's happened, this is that same patient, and look what's happened to the scapula here. And we, I told you before that the clavicle controls the scapula. And so if it bro it's broken, if you look at the scapula, what happens to it? And this is what happens in every case. The problem is you don't look at it. People are not looking for what the total function of the shoulder is. And so what's happening to the scapula? It's not going out to the side. It's not going up. It's rotating around the side of the body. And that's what's happening to it there. So this whole thing is rotating around because of the shortening of the clavicle. And if you look and get the right x-rays, you'll see this in almost every case in the shortened clavicle, you'll see this problem. And if you look at the patient, you see here, this is what you see from the front, you see a shortened, foreshortened uh, shoulder, doesn't look all that bad, but look at the back, it looks what happened to the back, you're having winging of the scapula, and this is not a true winging, what's happening is the scapula is migrating around the side of the body, and he's turning into a running tetrapod instead of a swinging tetrapod. Radiographically, I think it's problematic. I don't think we get adequate x-rays. I think if you're going to treat these things, you need to get adequate x-rays to know what you're treating. You need a good AP view, preferably getting both uh, clavicles in the same view if you can. Uh, and you need to get a, what they call a severe lordotic view, get a, a, a lordotic as possible, so you can get, a, a, get the view, because most of the deformity you see is not in this plane here. It's in this plane here. It's front to back, and this is what's missed all the time. Show an example of this. I think this is a, a picture of a patient. Came in with your AP x-ray. This patient had seen four different orthopedic surgeons before me. The mother was very upset because of the deformity of the clavicle. And everybody said that this is, it's not all that bad. Just leave it alone. But if you get a good lordotic view, this is the same patient. Uh, so the deformity is out of the plane where we get most x-rays. And so this, is no, th this doesn't change. This is just a better view of what the deformity really is. So you have to get adequate x-rays so you know what you're treating. Not going to talk about a non-operative treatment. You all know how to do that. It's either figure eight or sling. And uh, operative treatment, you have three choices, like in most bones of the body. Uh, sling versus figure eight. I think Anderson told us that the sling seems to work okay with fewer complications and more comfortable. So, to me, if you're going to treat them non-operatively, put them in a sling. Uh, review of literature. Looking to classic literature. If you were just to go back with near and row, you would never operate on one of these things. So they tell us that operations are bad. We just cause complications. If you just leave them alone, they do fine. And of course, over in the Scandinavian countries, they don't operate on anything, so, and they do fine. <laughs> so basically, simple fractures require simple solutions. So if you have non-displaced fractures, you don't have to do much, they're going to do fine in most cases. Uh, but there is a non-union rate. You go through the literature, you realize that people like Connolly, Baum, Jones, and Wick all start talking about the non-union rate, which is significant in some of these fractures, in spite of what the old literature said. And malunion rates are significant, too. Many articles on there, especially the McKee article in 03, talked about 
malunions and how the, the malunion actually affected shoulder function. These are the first papers that talked about the function and effect on the shoulder function. McKee's article looked, talked about 15 patients with malunion after conservative measures. Uh, and these are people who came in complaining of severe or, or significant uh, functional problems with their shoulder. Uh, they corrected it by an osteotomy and they improved their DASH score. So basically, not only, they said that the problem was the, the malunion, they corrected the malunion, the problem went away. So more than likely, it was related to the malunion of the, of the fracture. So I think that, as I said before, I think malalignment does call malfunction of the shoulder in some cases. Um, a meta-analysis looking at the old literature, uh, and they found about two, over 2,000 uh, cases. Uh, 22 studies from 1975 to 02, over 2,000 fractures, 97% mid shaft, non opera 53%, plate 30%, and uh, IM nail 17%. Overall, the results were not bad for the whole series. Uh, non opera treatment overall had a non union rate of uh, about 6%, but displaced fractures had a, a non union rate of 15%. So it's significant. This is, this is old literature. L plate versus non operative basic plate and non union rate overall was not that bad, but if, if you do, uh, take out the displaced fractures, you find there's a significant difference between operative and non-operative treatment. And this ha same thing happens when you compare IM uh, nailing with non-operative. Overall results aren't bad, but if you take out the non-operative or the displaced fractures, the non-union rate starts going up. So obviously, displaced and non-displaced have different outcomes with various treatments. Uh, the Canadian Orthopedic Trauma Society, which has done a number of different stu prospective studies, are the same ones who did the calcaneal study, designed this study here. And if you look at the study design, it's actually amazing they were able to show a better improvement. They couldn't decide on what plate to use, and so they chose the, the one plate that, they, that was a straight plate, which is not the greatest plate for clavicle fractures. But in spite of that, they showed that with plate fixation, a randomized <laughs> study, that uh, the plate fixation improved function, decreased malunion rate, and decreased the nonunion rate. So in, instead of what was not a greatly designed study, they can still show pretty good results based on uh, their, their study. Same way, another study, well, a cohort study, basically showed increased uh, outcomes, decreased non-union rate, and decreased non-union rate with plate fixation. But as you expect, it's, it, there's other problems going along with it, and they had a 15% hardware-related problems. So there's no, and I think this is a very realistic study. You have to realize that, like any operation, you're taking on risk when you do it. Um, but they do show increased, uh, a better improvement. So what are the indications, basically? People always talk about open fractures. I think open clavicle cla fractures are fairly rare, but they do occur occasionally. Uh, neurovascular injury, once again, not common, but when they happen, you certainly do need to stabilize the fracture to protect the vascular uh, repair. Floating shoulder, once again, very controversial. I used to feel more strongly about this, but I'm not sure the literature really supports fixing the clavicle and all floating shoulders. I think the biggest thing is unacceptable alignment, and the biggest controversy there, what is unacceptable? And this is what I think we're still struggling with right now. And finally, the risk of non-union, which I think is the greatest thing, but once again, we're, we're still struggling a little bit as to what the risks really are. Looking at unacceptable alignment, if you look at the literature, it seems to be if you have shortening greater than two centimeters, the literature seems to support that uh, uh, this is going to give you malfunction type problems and increase the risk of uh, non-unions. If you have displacement greater than 100%, uh, we talk about angulation, but I've never found a study that tells how much angulation you can accept. We really don't know. But assuming that the clavicle really needs its, its uh, S-shaped curve for its cam effect, I think you can... Uh, except very little angulation, otherwise it's going to affect the cam effect of the clavicle. And finally, comminution is certainly a, a risk for uh, non-unions or delayed unions. So shortening, uh, this is a case that we see, you see these all the time. This is significant shortening, and there's no question, though this may go on to heal, I think you're going to have significant problems with your shoulder function in a young active patient. So this is, would certainly be an indication for me to go ahead and fix this fracture. Comminution, especially segmental comminution, uh, there's no way to hold these things reduced. It's a high velocity injury. I think the healing is going to be slow. And I think in my hands, I think this is one that I certainly would recommend uh, fixing and restoring anatomy and getting stability. This kickstand fragment, this is actually uh, was not just described recently. Uh, they call it a Z fracture, but I think you think about it as a kickstand because it's keeping these two fragments apart. And there's absolutely no way that you can reduce these things close. It's ca caught in there. It's usually at 90 degrees, and the only way to do it is sort of dig it out of there and put it back in place. So I think the kickstand fragment, uh, when you see these things, this is, to me is an indication for surgery in almost all cases. Scapular fractures, and once again, this is, I think is very confusing. The literature used to indicate that maybe you should fix the clavicle to reduce the scapula. That's not true anymore. So I think you fix the, the, the clavicle based on its own merits. If it's comminuted, if it's shortened, you fix the clavicle for that reason, not assuming it's going to do something for your scapula. 
Segmental fractures, you can't see this well. This was a segmental fracture with an AC joint separation. This is a severe injury to the shoulder. And I think injuries like this require stabilization. These people are not going to do well with that much trauma to the shoulder with the amount of alignment and pain. So to me, I think it's a prime indication to think about fixing them. Cosmetic, and there's no question, some people come in just because they don't like the way, the way it looks. Uh, and there are some people, and it can be ugly. And we see this a lot in our trauma patients. Uh, they'll notice a, cl a clavicle fracture on the chest x-ray, and it'll be forgotten. And these people wander back in the clinic, you know, 8, 12 weeks later with this deformed shoulder, which they're very unhappy about. Uh, so I think we have to be more aware of the cosmetic effect of these things. Uh, and this one here was a bad thing. We actually had to just trim that bone off. It was so badly deformed. All we could do is not knock the bump off for Non-unions do occur, and I think if you have a non-union, the operative treatment of these things is certainly indicated, and, and, and though there are some asymptomatic non-unions, the vast majority of them are symptomatic, and you should think about fixing them. The goals of surgical repair, basically, I think that if you're going to fix a clavicle fracture, you want to make it, make it anatomic, um, and so you can, as close is not good enough. You want to get restored the length, you want sort of rotation, and you want to restore that S-shaped curve to it. You want to get stable fixation, which allows early functional activities. And you want to get a stable soft tissue uh, coverage and repair. And the big question is early return to function. I have a lot of people come in to see me because they want their clavicle fixed. They want to get back uh, on their bike or on their horse sooner than they should before. That's a big mistake. If you do that, you're going to have a lot of failures. So you never tell me to do up to get them back to their functions earlier because they'll get back too soon and they'll pull your repair apart. So early return to function to me is not a good indication for fixing them. Uh, surgical repair, you have a choice of how to do this, plate uh, versus uh, I am uh, nailing. I think the plate is great for acute or delayed, all patterns, all sizes, and you can plate it either superior or inferiorly. I am nail, I think, is good for acute fractures, simple patterns, but you have to have an adequate canal, and, but you can do either retrograde or integrate, but in my hands, I've not been real successful with using uh, the intermedially device, though the literature certainly supports its use. Uh, the way I do it, once again, these are my preferences, and you have to sort of decide how you want to do it, but this way it works for me. I position them with supine on a table I can x-ray through, a big roll between their shoulder blades, which sort of retracts the shoulders, and most of the reduction is done when you do that. Pos positioning here, your incision, you can either follow the superior part of the, uh, the clavicle, or you can do, and, and some people you can actually do a, a, a transverse incision like that for its, or simple fracture patterns. Always want to find a nerve, it's always there. You want to find it and protect it. You want to tell the patient they may have some numbness beforehand, uh, uh, after the surgery. Talking about location, once again, I'm going to show you this picture here. To me, when you see this type of anatomy, this is telling me, put your plate here, because uh, you're not doing any stripping. And this is, once again, my preference. The literature supports both methods. But to me, as an intermembranous bone, the blood supply is very important. And to put it any other place up on top there, you're going to do more stripping and you run the potential of possibly having problems with healing. Uh, though, once again, I think this is more empiric that I'm saying this. The literature does not support that. But I think you have to be very careful uh, as to where you're doing further stripping uh, to the bone. Uh, types of plates, you can use pelvic recon. You can use the various anatomic type plates. Uh, anterior inferior plating, there's certainly pros. It decreased plate irritation, decreased wound problems. Uh, and there's certainly good results in the literature. But I think the cons are... Uh, it's not on the tension side, decreased strength. My biggest thing is stripping. I'm very concerned about the stripping of the muscle. Superior plating is on the tension side, cons very consistent anatomy. Uh, the plates sit on there very nicely superiorly. Um, I think me mechanically it's, it's a, a nice place to put it, and it has minimal additional stripping. There's obviously plate irritation is the biggest problem, and when you put a plate on up there, you have to tell them that they may need to have it taken off at some point. Anatomic plates, uh, they don't always fit. And so these are, an these are not anatomic plates. They're anato anatomically designed plates. Uh, but they don't fit all clavicle fractures because clavicles come in different girths and stuff like that. They seem to fit fairly well in males. But uh, smaller bones, or especially in females, the plates don't fit all that well. So be very aware of that. I think some of the newer plates, which are contourable at the ends, allow you some ability uh, to uh, uh, contour the plates a little bit there. But be aware of the anatomic plates because they don't always fit. Uh, there was biomechanical testing basically looking at this thing, and they basically showed that the, the pl various types of plates are the strongest. The big question is, how strong do you need to be? And if you re anatomically reduce the fractures, you don't need a big, strong plate on most of these clavicles unless you have segmental comminution. So I think that these big, heavy plates we're using right now, many times I think are overkill. One thing they do tell us is that the, the, the intermedially nailing is by far the least stable of all the constructs that we have. So be very aware of that. But we really don't know what the best ideal the biomechanic structure really is, and I think it depends on the size of the bone and the fracture pattern more than anything else. 
Surgical tips, I think positioning is critical. You have to have adequate imaging so you can see uh, that you're fixing anatomically. You want to do minimal dissection. Uh, use lag screws, but use small lag screws, two sevens or 2.0s. These are small fragments. You try to put bigger screws in them, you're going to break them apart, and it's going to affect your stability. You want to right-size the plate, and what I mean that you don't have just one set of plates on the table. You need to have multiple different plates there, depending on the size of the patient and the configuration of the fracture. I think the locking plates are great for both medium and lateral fragments with these small segments where you give you fixation, though I really don't see a need for locking screws in, in most mid-shaft fractures. It's just not necessary. And you have to have a meticulous closure. People talk about wound problems. I think it's because they're rushing through and don't do an adequate closure. If you take your time and do an adequate closure, these people's wounds will do very well. And plate irritation is really a minor problem. And you want to restrict their activity. Once again, if you go back and tell them to do anything you want to do, they're going to pull your constructs apart. So put them in a sling, restrict their activity to, to see some healing, because you hate to have them come back at, at two or three weeks with everything pulled apart, and you will see that. Talking about right-sizing plates, I see a lot of adolescent uh, kids in my practice with fractures, and I think with these things you can use small plates, and I've been using, especially on these small females, uh, a one-inch incision and a 2.7 pelvic recon plate, which works very well on them. You can put it through a very small incision, and they do very well with that. So these are small bones, so you want to use small plates. Distal clavicle and, and also uh, medial clavicle, you use the locking sort of plates on there, which works very well. Um, Intermedial devices really don't make any sense. Putting a straight pin in a curved bone doesn't make sense to me because you can't get it anatomically reduced. Um, talking about Jubel and the titanium flexible nail, literature certainly supports this. It's actually a picture out of their series. You see it got it reduced, but it's not anatomic. Plate irritation, or the pin irritation is very common. Uh, they go on to heal, but with shortening and displacement. And so once again, you, uh, biomechanically, they're very unstable, and I don't think it's a good device, especially for common due to fractures. Uh, there's concerns and problems. The starting point is difficult. Pain over the tip of the, of the uh, pin is very common, and they almost always have to be removed. Complications will occur. If you operate on uh, enough of anything, you'll see complications, but these can be minimized by appropriate surgical technique and appropriate uh, attention to detail. So in conclusion, I think the, uh, the uh, clavicle is a highly evolved osseous structure. Uh, it's an integral component of shoulder function. It has a very consistent anatomic uh, configuration. I think in, energy, uh, injury alters the configuration and the function, and for this reason, I think that surgery is indicated to avoid functional healing and cosmetic problems. Uh, I think if you're going to fix one, anatomic rest restoration should always be your goal with stable fixation. And I think the uh, exact indications are evolving over time, and hopefully with better studies and better techniques and better imaging, we'll have a much better idea as to which fractures need to be fixed and which ones we can really help and which ones we can leave alone and let nature uh, do its, run its course. So thank you very much. Thank you.